All right, so our first lecture of Global 2, coming right at you. It is Mr. Casey, absolutism. We're going to go from absolutism uh, all the way through the English Civil War, end up at the Enlightenment, and then finish with the Scientific Revolution. So this is our first unit of the year. Here we go. So vocab to know. So after 1492 is really where this course starts, right? So we're talking absolutism, first word there. Iron fist control. That's what you need to understand. It's somebody who's trying to control the way that their people interact with others. It's a it's a forced compliance, right? You are supposed to listen to the king or queen, and that's it. There's no extra government that's supposed to help you. So there's no parliament, or if there is, it doesn't do anything. Uh, they have the Estates General in France, but it doesn't do anything, right? It's the king or it's the queen. Iron fist control. Uh, you know the word monarchy, but I, I sort of put it on there just to make sure that's a you know, global nine term, but just, just know that a monarch is a king or queen, right? Divine right. A lot of these rulers, in order for people to be willing to follow absolutism, you have to come up with an ideology that supports it. Divine right is, is perfect for that. Basically, what they said is that God has chosen me to be king or queen, and therefore you got to listen to me. Right? To violate um, or disrespect me is to disrespect God. And then modernization and westernization are two themes of this course. Many rulers will decide to modernize or westernize throughout history. So like we're going to talk about Peter the Great doing this, but in subsequent lectures we'll be talking about Kamal Ataturk doing this in Turkey. Like it's, it's a thing that rulers do. They're great words to use on a regent's essay. Okay. So modernization, try to make sure that your country becomes, um, I don't want to say updated to the 21st century, right? But you're trying to make it so that there's new railroads, new bridges. You're trying to make your military go from like <laughs> cavalry charges to something a little bit more sophisticated. You want to make sure that you have rifles instead of just sabers, uh, for an example. And then westernization is to be like Western Europe. So this is where you're going to get some tighter fit clothing for women. You're going to start to maybe get some uh, languages like uh, Dutch. Uh, you'll get a language like French, uh, English, right? Trying to adopt what Western Europe is doing, okay? So the Eastern countries will try to do this. Middle Eastern countries. So that's our vocab. So why absolutism? It's all about money, guys. So to dominate the triangle trade, what they wanted to do was uh, streamline the ability to do so. So there's, there's one ruler, and that ruler is uh, telling everyone what to do. It makes for a, a, a easier way to dominate some trade like this. And of course, the triangle trade is the European nations stealing people from Africa and then bringing them to the New World, forcing them slavery on these plantations which were horrific and we'll talk more about them on places like Haiti it's it's ugly it's nasty but it's it's absolutism sort of works to control this trade and then you've got these strong militaries and navies that are basically the arm of these monarchs trying to make sure that other nations aren't stealing their gold as they're coming back. You know, Spain was notorious for getting stolen from. The English were great pirates. And so you get that sort of you know, antagonism between the two, rivalry, if you will. The divine right sort of keeps this, this system going. So anytime anyone wanted to question this system, it was divine right, right? God chose the ruler, so shut your mouth. So let's start with absolutism in Russia. I got a, a map to sort of give you a, a picture of just how large Russia is. We'll, we'll do for each of these, try to give you like a little bit of background knowledge. But so through cultural diffusion, what is, you know, Russia really? It's a mixture of many different cultures, right? The Vikings, the Mongols, okay, that's Timurian's land, right? And then the Byzantines. The Byzantines uh, will move up to the north. If you recall, so who are the Byzantines, right? Justinian and Theodora. Remember them? Like Theodora's great speech. You know, we're not going to run. You know, I'd rather die a, a noble, bury me in purple. You know, the whole thing, right? So 
that Eastern Orthodox Church of Justinian and Theodora, the Hagia Sophia, right, moved from Byzantium, like from Constantinople, and moved up to the north to Russia because the Turks came in with their cannons and destroyed the walls of Constantinople and then renamed it Istanbul. So that's uh, that's the Dark Ages lecture if you need to like refresh yourself on it. But but basically, those people, right, the Vikings, the Bruce, as they called them, right, is where you get Russia. And then you get the Mongols, and then you get the Byzantines. Like, that cultural diffusion creates a really tough people. Like, think about some of the toughest people we've been talking about. Mix them together, you get the Russians, which is pretty cool. And the Russians had that Byzantium, you know, Byzantine culture behind them. And if you recall, who are the Byzantines really? They're just the, the Romans, right? That's, that's who they are. So the Russians take this Roman culture thing, which many of the European nations will do, but the Russians will call their leader Tsar, right? C-Z-A-R. What does that look like? It looks like Caesar, right? So to that end, it's like this Julius Caesar kind of thing that's always in the back of the of the culture of Russia. So let's talk about Peter the Great, like who he is. I'll give you a quick story and then we'll, we'll get into sort of what he did. So young boy, uh, Peter was born to a family that his brother was, was really sickly, and his father was old, and, and probably not old by our, our standards, but getting old, and uh, his father passes away, and it's supposed to be that uh, Peter's brother uh, is supposed to take the throne, Alexei, right? But it didn't, it didn't work out that way. He was a sick boy, and uh, so there becomes an opportunity, right? So Peter has this... Uh, Oh, there he is, Zari Lexi, right? That's his father. Um, so when he passes away, this woman right here, Sophia, is going to see some opportunity. She is the stepsister of Peter the Great. And she wants to sort of use this moment where there's a crisis to take power. So she gets the guards together and says, listen, guards, I, you know, I got your back. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you much more autonomy, right? More freedom to do what you want to do. You're going to support me in this coup, this takeover, right? A coup is a takeover of government. And so the palace guards working together, realizing this is a great opportunity for them to increase their power and money and wealth, right? They support Sophia. And so Sophia comes into the throne room. And Peter will never forget this, right? There's, there's the guards, by the way. He's in the throne room with his mom. And uh, a couple of the guards that are loyal to to the royal family, the Romanovs, as we'll as we'll call them, the uh, they fight off, and then they ultimately fall to the palace guards. So now, his mother is looking at Sophia and these men who are basically coming to kill you, and she is like so distraught, right? Because this is her baby boy, and she says uh, something like, you know please, please, not my baby boy, please, please spare him, you know, and Sophia says, okay, she says, I'll spare him, but you must leave an exile, right, to exile someone is to kick them out, it's like, uh, I want you gone, I don't want you in the capital city, like, I don't want you in Moscow, I want you out, uh, some remote village, you get out, and I will spare you, because I am merciful, and so, uh, they take the deal, because <laughs> that's the only deal on the table, right, guys, and so uh, they leave to a small village in Russia with a lot of Western influence. There's a lot of German people living in this, this small village. And so they, they go to the village and Peter grows up. He knows he's royalty, right? But like he realizes like he's lost. And so while he's uh, in this village, he kind of gets, uh, he's, he's walking around and he finds this little boat inside this um, a shed near the water and he takes it out and he's like I love this and it wasn't a big boat or anything it's a little small sailboat but point is this like he started to develop this love for sailing he also was you know surrounded by westerners and and saw the way that their women had more freedom and how their women dressed differently he's starting to pick up a little bit of German right and so like through this he's starting to get this love for the west love for sailing and then Peter grows up and by all accounts, Sophia starts to hear that there's this boy who has grown to be a man. Six foot seven, huge dude, like tall, hulking Goliath, okay? Strong, 
um, body, strong will, and some people are talking that maybe he should be king. And she couldn't have that, of course, right? So she sends the same guards, right, to go assassinate Peter. And so they show up and come to the house. And they say that uh, Tsar Peter, right, soon to be, uh, Peter is looking out at these guards as they come up the the steps, the same footsteps that he had heard when he was just a boy. And they open the door and they look at this hulking giant. And he stares back at them. And the guards reported it was almost like this like divine about him uh, something otherworldly now maybe it was just because he was a huge dude but there was something different about peter and as he's staring into them they do this thing that changes history they kneel right they kneel before czar uh who they think to be czar peter right he is the rightful czar he is the rightful king of russia and so um Peter decides to go back to Sophia. This time he's going to get uh, some revenge. And he takes his stepsister Sophia and says, you know, I'm not going to kill you. (laughs) You spared me, so I'm going to spare you. I'm going to put you in a convent, a nunnery, like where nuns are supposed to be, for the rest of your life. And that is where you will stay. That is where you will be. And so here's this like painting. She does not look happy, right? she's the aunt and she is stuck in this nunnery for the remainder of her life now what does peter end up going off to do he is now going to create an absolute monarchy he's going to rule with an iron fist so with that story what i'd like for you to do is is try to fill out the story card in your notes okay do the very best that you can and then um, what i'll do is i'll just show you the words here And that's our story. Now, let's get to our notes, okay? The Romanov dynasty. So, it's going to end in a basement in 1917. That's your cliffhanger for today. But it begins in 1613 with Peter the Great. Okay, and there's a beautiful statue there dedicated to Peter the Great in in St. Petersburg. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, who is he? Well, Peter starts out, he's, he's betrayed. He, he learns that. He, he feels that. And when he takes back the throne, he decides what we're going to do is we're going to centralize power. Okay, We're going to bring it to an absolute monarchy because I can't trust anybody. I will never trust anybody. Okay, And begins modernizing and westernizing. So what does modernization look like? Well, specifics. He's going to build the St. Petersburg capital. He calls it the window to the west. He models it on cities in um, uh, Holland and Sweden, the Netherlands, okay? The, the Netherlands uh, built their cities on a swamp, so he kind of like takes some of those those ideas to be able to make St. Petersburg, which was also near a swamp. He forces his nobles to live there. That's something that we'll see later monarchs like Louis the Fourteenth of France do, okay? So he can watch them, because remember, he never trusts anybody, and he, he, he learns that from Sophia. Sophia teaches him that. And so you got this window to the west, this beautiful city. He also is going to rebuild the Russian military, right? Part of modernization is you got to make sure your military is up to snuff with other nations. And he needed to take over land to build St. Petersburg from the Swedes. So he goes to war with Sweden, and he's going to use guns and cannons to make it work. Okay, so, you know, remember those Byzantine influence, okay? Maybe he learned something from from that taking of Constantinople. Cannons work, right? Okay. One thing that he's going to do that shows absolutism very well, but also shows modernization, is he melts down these church bells throughout the uh, city, and he's melting them down, well, across the region, really, and using them for bullets, which is very odd. Goes to war with Sweden, gains this warm water port, the Baltic Sea there. He's going to gain the Baltic Sea. And why is it important to have a warm water port? Well, if you have a cold water port like the Russians have, uh, you can't really get a boat through ice, right? 
So a warm water port allows you to have more trade, allows you to get your soldiers out, it allows you to have a navy. This is a big deal. And throughout its history, Russia is going to try to gain more warm water ports. We'll talk about that in a minute. He also expands to the Pacific Ocean, which is going to create some problems later on for the, for the Russians, in trying to expand and sort of borders Korea. So he is expanding east, he's expanding west. This is all a part of modernization. Now, westernization. Well, he wanted his people to look like westerners. He also wanted to show his absolute force. So what he does, he walks in, he's got you know, all these nobles around, and he just grabs one of his nobles by the beard and produces scissors and cuts off his beard right in front of him. Like, what a power move, right? So these, these Russians who grow their beards, it's a sign of masculinity, and he's like chopping it off right in front of these guys. So why does he do this? Well, he wants Russia to be respected. He wants Russia to be like the West. He realized that the West was very powerful, very strong. And he wanted Russia, who was sort of stuck in the Stone Ages, to come back to that level, uh, or, or, or ascend to that level, I should say, of the Western nations. Now, for the wealthy, they could get out of this. Now, maybe not the guy who got his beard chopped off right in front of him, but the other nobles could get out of this if they paid a beard tax. That was a really smart way for him to raise revenue. These guys would have to wear a little coin, uh, like you see there, to sort of represent that they had paid the beard tax. So this was his way of like jump-starting westernization. As far as westernizing the education system, he is making it so you got to learn the alphabet. The alphabet comes all the way back to like the ancient Phoenicians who have roots all the way back to like Greek times, okay? But the, the point is, is that the alphabet, the English, you know, English the alphabet there is going to be something that he is promoting in schools, getting away from the traditional Cyrillic alphabet. You can see Cyrillic right on that, uh, that coin. It's a, it's a different alphabet. There's different letters. It's, it's definitely different. So he's trying to westernize his country. He also is huge in the way of promoting women's rights allowed women to marry for for choice, for love, sort of gets rid, not rid, but sort of tries to get less people into those arranged marriages. That was the way that Russians did it. Wear tighter fitted clothing. That's a corset. That's what that picture is. I tried to find you an example. You can see how it creates that hourglass shape in, in women. He's trying to at least open the door for women to wear tighter fitted clothing. Of course, that would be an example of that. I'm not saying every Russian woman had to wear a corset. What I'm saying is that there is getting away from just the, the loose fit robes that women had to wear. They could talk while men were in the room. That was something that was not happening in Russia. You, you had like a separate room for women while men were, were there so that the men could, could do, you know, business talk or whatever but what women were not supposed to be around they were supposed to be like you ever heard the phrase like seen not uh not heard and encourage women to be able to leave the home more freely without the permission of their husbands again this is what he's trying to do from the top down does it happen everywhere i'm sure it didn't but these are the reforms that he's trying to put in place and for that that's a that's a pretty good slate of reforms now, uh, one thing you can check out if you want to learn about uh, Peter the Great and you know, never trusting anybody and all these ideas I'm trying to get out of the story, um, my rap, uh, Peter the Great, is a really good one. So check it out. It's to Juice World Lucid Dreams. Really cool stuff. All right. Now, what happens after Peter the Great? We get Catherine the Great. And Catherine the Great is going to take power from her husband in a coup. So a coup is a takeover. So like Sophia led a coup against Peter. Catherine is going to lead a coup against her husband, I believe that's Peter III, and she is successful in doing so, which is pretty insane. She also defeats the Ottoman Empire, an empire that is a primarily Muslim empire that we'll be talking more about, called the sick old man of Europe, but for now, the Ottoman Empire is in the Middle East, and she takes it over, gets a warm water port, just like Peter the Great did. This one is the Black Sea so that she can start to dominate trade in the Middle East. 
She almost got rid of serfdom. So a serf can never leave the land. You remember that, right? Difference between a serf and a peasant. Okay. Serfdom was primarily used in Russia as opposed to peasantry. So she was going to get rid of it. And the serfs had this rebellion. She had to put it down. And after that, there was no chance for her. The public opinion was so negative towards serfs. So there's no way she was going to, to ever uh, get rid of serfdom. But it was close. And last but not least, and I, I can't speak too much about this, right? I'm a public school teacher, but there's a lot of propaganda surrounding Catherine the Great that, that you can go look up on your own. It's, it's gross stuff. I, the men really hated her during her time. You'll find this with, with Elizabeth of England, the same thing. There's this patriarchal, like, anger that's coming out against Catherine, and they're trying to smear her legacy, say that she did some things that she didn't, try to uh, just... Real negative stuff, guys. So there was like this active campaign to attack her legacy. I've given you some, some of the things that she was able to do. Okay. So that is Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Now let's move on to Spain. So we'll go to Spain. We'll go to uh, France and England and sort of bring it all full circle. So here we go. Absolutism in Spain. Start off with what did we talk about with Spain last time? Like Spain had historically been taken over by the Umayyads, by the Saracens, by, by the Muslim empires. And what happened is the Muslim empires had gone all the way up to Tours. Tours is a place in France, right? In Tour de France. Okay. Got really close, but Charles the Heron Martel was able to push them back. So what happened is in Spain, in the south, there was a real, real strong Muslim presence. Okay. Uh, like Cordoba, for example, there was this real, real strong presence. And then as you got further north, there was less so, okay? What happens is Spain is a Catholic nation. It is close to Catholicism, okay? It's pretty close to Italy too, right? Mediterranean and all that. What will happen is the Catholics and Muslims are going to wrestle for power and slowly the Catholics will push the Muslims out back down to North Africa. This is called the Reconquista. It takes time. It takes almost 500 years. It's slow and steady moving. And what happens is the Spanish build up armies and then push down the, the, the Muslims, push them further south, push them further south. Along the way, while they're expelling the Muslims, they're also expelling all the Jews, uh, killing many of them. This is, this is a brutal, bloody takeover. Reminds you of the Crusades in a way, right? It's this bloody battle between faiths over this, this piece of land we call Spain. So the Reconquista. Good one to know. And I did talk to you about the Reconquista last year. So if you recall, Ferdinand and Isabella, they are the Catholic monarchs that join together and create what we would consider Spain. They, they join um, their kingdoms together. Anyway, Isabella is that woman that would walk in a white dress on the battlefield, right? And the blood would soak up. Okay, that that's the person. So highly uh, Catholic. That's the reason why she gave the ships to Columbus, hoping to spread Catholicism. So that's what you know about Spain. And she is at the forefront of the Reconquista, pushing out the Muslims, pushing out the Jewish people. So now, how does Spain become world stage power? Well, they signed something called the Treaty of Tordesillas with Portugal. If you recall, Spain and Portugal are the two nations that like dominate the new world. And, and a lot of it has to do with this treaty. So Cortes was the Spaniard. He's the conquistador, right? And then you had Pizarro, who was on the other side of things, who destroys the Incan people. Okay. What will happen is the Treaty of Tordesillas is brokered by the Pope. So Spain and Portugal are both Catholic nations, and the Pope doesn't want Catholic nations fighting against each other. That's bad for business. So they split up the New World. And it's sort of arbitrary, and no one has a map. Like, they don't really know, so they kind of like picking a spot and then drawing a line. And the Treaty of Tordesillas really, really, if you look at that map, who gets the better side of the deal? Spain, obviously. So Spain begins purging the Aztecs from the from Tenochtitlan, they take all the gold from the Aztecs, and the Aztecs were just incredibly wealthy. The Portuguese 
Meanwhile, they take over Brazil and they, they, they dominate that land of the, the Amazons. So Spain gets the best of the deal of the Treaty of Tordesillas when they split the world, split the new world as they called it. And then what they're going to do is build these huge ships called galleon ships and transport the gold taken by the conquistadors, stolen, back to the new world. After Ferdinand and Isabella, we get a sequence of kings, but Philip II, he's the one that we need to know something about. His father was Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. Basically what happens is Philip is given Spain. Spain is like his territory. That's yours, buddy. Like, take it over. And Philip was militant Catholicism. Like, he loved Catholicism, and he is going to embrace something called the Inquisition. The Inquisition was a torture spree used by the Spanish to make sure that there were nobody, no more Muslims, no more Jewish people left in Spain. And they would break you on the wheel, as you see there, do also you know, horrible things. You, know, you can ask me about it in class. But basically the idea was you're going to be Catholic or we're going to torture you until you say you're Catholic or we'll kill you. Now, there is a group called the Jesuits who is very instrumental in doing this. They are like the sword of God in many ways. This militant group that goes out and makes sure that they spread the word of Catholicism, but often they do it through the sword, like, you know, convert or die kind of deal. Again, different from the Jesuits today. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is Spain is a highly militant Catholicism, and they're willing to fight you on your faith. They think that Catholicism is the only faith. That's the important point that you need to get from this. So there's Philip II, the most Catholic king, as he tried to call himself. Uh, to be Spanish is to be Catholic. There was no other religion for him. So this isn't like a situation where you can you can pay a tax and you can practice your own faith. None of that. Now he claims divine right. You're getting the theme, right? Everyone's doing this, okay? God chose me. The Pope supports me. I have the right to spread Catholicism. And he's going to use that stolen gold from the Aztecs to build this wonderfully powerful Spanish Armada. It's a huge fleet of ships. It's one of the most famous navies in the world. So the Spanish Armada, famous navy. And here's what happens next. So as Spain is rising up as a Catholic nation, England is rising up, but they are not Catholic. They are a Protestant nation, okay? So that's like a branch of Martin Luther's ideas, right? Remember the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, 95 Theses, right? All that stuff where they're breaking from the church and they're saying that they don't have to listen to the Pope. That's what England embraced. England embraced that because of Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, who wanted to have um, a son, also wanted to have a divorce. And if you're Catholic, you can't divorce. So what was happening here was Henry VIII said, well, fine, if I can't divorce, I will just create my own church. I'll make it a Protestant church. He called it the Anglican Church or the Church of England. So England has its own church because Henry VIII wanted to you know, get a divorce, which is insane but that's the way history goes so henry the eighth hated elizabeth felt like uh, he she should be a man she wasn't but when henry the eighth passed it is going to be elizabeth who eventually gets power and you're going to read a whole uh, article on elizabeth so you'll get a deeper understanding of of how she got to be queen it's pretty cool stuff but point is this when she's queen she is going to really bring a golden age to, to England, Shakespeare, the whole nine. It's pretty cool stuff. She also has to battle against uh, that woman there, Mary Queen of Scots, her sister, who was Catholic and trying to battle against her. She it's a It's a whole movie that I would love to show you someday, Elizabeth, golden age. But anyway, point is this. She never marries, pursues this policy of tolerance except when it came to her sister who tried to have her killed so mary tried to kill elizabeth tried to get her assassinated ultimately elizabeth is able to foil that plot and she has her sister killed brutal stuff okay this is a brutal world that she's living in and elizabeth say a lot about her she is a strong woman okay it promotes tolerance she says you know it's okay if you're you're catholic but 
but I'm Protestant. Uh, England's a Protestant nation. She really uses that marriage angle so that she uh, can get guys, other kings, to like be kind to England, but she never actually married any of them. So, what happens in 1588 to change all this? Well, Philip II, Milton Catholicism, is looking out at Elizabeth, who says, I won't marry you. You know, we're not going to have a marriage. And feeling spurned, feeling angered, also angered by the fact that England is going to uh, continue its piracy and steal from the Spanish uh, galleon ships. There's this financial angle, there's this marriage angle, and pretty much Philip has had enough. So he is going to decide to take that Protestant nation over, make them Catholic, like bring the force of the Inquisition down upon it. And so he raises that armada together, and this is the man, Philip II, with the most powerful navy in the world, the most wealthy country in the world, against a woman, a group of pirates from England. So, what happens? The fleet of ships come, and the fleet of ships gets outside the English Channel when a storm hits. So as the Amarna is going to go into the channel, these big galleon ships, they're huge, remember. That makes them slower, but it allows them to like hold more soldiers and horses. So if that fleet of ships lands, it's game over. So what Elizabeth does is she's like, okay, as the storm's approaching, she goes full, full, like, we're going to fight to the death. She calls the pirates in, Guy likes, uh, guys like Sir Walter Riley, which I know Sir Walter Raleigh doesn't sound like a pirate name, but humor me here, it's England. And so the pirates come together and they are like, listen, Elizabeth, like give us this stuff called pitch. Pitch is a substance, it's like black tar that can really easily be flammable. She says, you know, we'll get you this one. So what the English ships do is as the galleon ships are anchored because the storm, they can't move through the storm. The English ships, these really fast, small English ships filled with pitch, they light the ships on fire as they get close to the Spanish ships, and then they jump off. And, of course, the English ships are on fire, but so are the Spanish ships. And it's this final fury of assault that is going to take down the Spanish Armada. So what happens afterwards? Sorry, it's a lot of water. Philip is defeated by the storm and the fire ships. And afterwards, stuck in debt. They are no longer that golden, you know, age Spain. Like, after this, all over, guys. So, we won't talk a whole lot about Spain after this point. It, we'll talk a little bit about it with Latin America. But really, this is, this is the high water mark of Spain. And after this, they are a defeated nation. They're in huge amounts of debt. After the galleon ships are destroyed, it's bad. Now, let's talk about France. That's Louis XIV with the good hair, right? Louis XIV is going to come into a country that's had a history of religious persecution. Okay, There was this day where the Protestants, which in France we called them Huguenots, okay? The Huguenots, our Protestants, were encouraged to celebrate this special saint, St. Bartholomew. They are going to celebrate... And so they go to the city, and they're having this bunch of fun. Meanwhile, what the Catholics are doing is basically encircling the city. They come in, and as they're feasting and celebrating, they murder all these Huguenots. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. I bring it up because it's important for you to understand that France is a Catholic nation, but it is persecuting those Protestants. There's a real religious division between the two nations. Religion is key to understanding this time period. So Louis XIV comes in, he does the thing, claims divine right, rules with an iron fist. He's going to do a lot of the things that you've heard me say already. He does something, though, that's, he's going full Philip II here. He revokes something called the Edict of Nantes, which was a peace treaty that was orchestrated between Huguenots and Catholics that allows for religious freedom and peace. It was a nice thing that they were able to do. He, he rips that up. He's like, no, we're going to be Catholic, 
and we're going to have a Catholic state, and we're going to do it better than Philip II did. Uh, here's a great example of his divine right appeal. Okay, so you've got himself calling himself the Sun King, which you can see down in the right corner. That's like a little medallion. And you can see that angel sort of bestowing this Roman crown. That's like a Julius Caesar crown. He's even wearing uh, the Roman outfit and Roman gear. So you can see there's a lot of Roman ties. Uh, talk to me in class about why that's really ironic for a French person to be saying, you know, I want to be like a Roman. Anywho, famously said, I am the state, though, and he never called his um, estates general. The estates general was a body of nobles that would make laws and decisions. There was some bourgeoisie in there. But anyway, the estates general is like our Senate. Uh, supposed to make laws. He never called them once. He said, no, 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 I'll make all the laws. Like, you guys can just shut up. I don't need to talk to you. Like, whatever. Okay. So he is totally embracing this absolutism idea. He's claiming this divine right. He's supported by a guy named uh, Bishop Jacques Rousseau, who does the thing, right? Says, divine right is why we need to follow Louis. And if, if Louis ever makes some bad decisions or is ever cruel or mean, God will punish him. So we don't need to worry about it. We can trust King Louis XIV. So he's going to go after the Huguenots in a big way, <clears throat> lead massacres, and just create that Catholic state that we saw Spain try to do. He also builds this. This is the most important place in all of our course for Global 2, I think. It's, it's a place we just keep coming back to. It's called the Palace of Versailles. It is huge. It is massive. It is a beautiful place to be. So here's his beautiful palace. This is just for him and his nobles, okay? Mostly for him. So the Palace of Versailles, most important place in global history too. Gotta know it. He, in order to pay for this, is going to do something called, uh, he's going to sell nobility titles. Basically, he's going to say, listen, I need to pay for this. And maybe you're a rich shopkeeper, but you don't have the title of duke or dutch right so what i'll do is i'll say uh you can become a duke if you pay me up front whatever you know ten thousand dollars or something he's saying pay me up front and then after you're a noble you'll never have to pay taxes again so in the short term he gets this huge chunk of money from all these people saying hey i'll be a noble i'll pay one time so i never have to pay taxes again and in the long term, he's hurting his country because all those people now aren't paying taxes. And so now he's got to tax who? Tax the poor. He's got to tax the peasants, right? So all these people come out in droves to say, hey, I want to become a noble. It's socially awesome to be a noble because now people have to respect me. But number two, I don't have to pay taxes anymore. Oh, yeah, let me do that. So he gets his palace of Versailles built. It's one of those things where it's a short term. Awesome. It, you know, for him, he gets that. <laughs> In the long term, when he dies, his people will suffer because of the sins of Louis XIV. Here's the uh, Hall of Mirrors, a really important place to be. It's it's so awesome. I, I was there a couple of years ago. It's incredible. Like gold everywhere. It's lavish for sure. So, Louis XIV, what does he do? He's involved in a ton of foreign wars. He, he creates an incredible military but all these foreign wars are going to lose him a lot of money he goes to war with a lot of the um, uh, states like austria netherlands i mean he's just always in war so that of course costs money he also establishes something called the code noir which code noir is something that will be used over in haiti which we'll talk about later brutal punishment of slaves everything from wearing like masks and collars and just horrific they, a master could could literally kill their slave and there's no repercussions at all they, they could just do it because slave is property brutal stuff and he also expels all the jewish people from france again just want to show you there's this real anti-semitic air throughout global history and you see it here as well and then last but not least establishes something called the Bastille. It's the French prison camp where they would put anybody who spoke out against the king or nobles here. There's uh, rumors that the King Louis XIV put his brother in there, made him wear this iron mask, all this really, really interesting stuff. Anyway, 
point is this. That is Louis XIV's reign. And these are the absolute monarchs that I would like you to have an idea about. Okay, You've got from left to right, you go Peter the Great, then you go to Catherine. Then you go to Ferdinand and Isabella, and then Philip. And then at the bottom there, you've got Elizabeth, and you've got Louis XIV. These are the people that you should be familiar with. Okay. Now, transitioning from absolutism, we're going to go to the English Civil War. Okay, because that sort of changes history as big ripple effects. And this will be my bridge between absolutism and then to the Enlightenment. So last we talked about, about England, right? When we were talking, we talked about Robin Hood. Remember the film? Okay, great Russell Crowe film. And then you've got King John over there on the left. Well, King John has a parliament. A parliament is like our Senate. It's like the Estates General of France. So they're supposed to make laws. Well, you're going to theme here. Absolute monarchs don't like to share power. So it took this you know, Robin Hood event, right? It took for King John to sign this Magna Carta. And basically what he said was, I'll work with, with Parliament before I raise, raise taxes. So this is where I last left off. The Magna Carta was signed. It limited the power of the king. Made it so the king had to ask Parliament before raising taxes. That's where I left you off. So how does a civil war break out afterwards? Well, England has religious problems. Protestant Catholic, you guessed it, right? So there's this Protestant you know, church, the Church of England. We talked about how Henry VIII made that. And then you've got Elizabeth, who is totally tolerant. But after her, you get Charles, who's a Catholic. That's going to create this division. And I know like today we're very secular. We're very much like, you know, care about the here and now. But remember, 1600s, religion's everything. So you get the Puritans who, who are Protestants, but believe that like the church is like too corrupt. You know, the Anglican church, the Church of England, the one Henry VIII made too corrupt. Like we need to go way back to like, who are these Puritans? They are like the pilgrims. They are people who trying to purify the church and so you get this very puritan protestant versus this catholic and and it's going to create some nasty division so how does the civil war sort of shake out well there's two sides of the civil war you get the cavaliers which the cavaliers support the king uh, the king at the time was charles the first shown there and he is catholic they are mostly the wealthy of england and they are many of them Anglican church officials. Okay. So you get this, and, and of course Catholics too. On the other side, you get the roundheads. And the roundheads, they aren't Catholic. Okay. They are mostly Puritans. Uh, they are supporters of Parliament. They are urban, like they live in the city. They are the folks who say we need to be Protestant, but we need to clean up the church quite a bit in order to do it. And we definitely don't want a Catholic king. That's that's not what we want. So there are your two sides of the Civil War. One who support the king, the other who support Parliament. So who wins in this? Well, Charles I is captured by the Roundheads. And this is a crazy moment in history. They take a divine right monarch. Yes, Charles I claimed divine right, and they behead him in front of the people. And it's this moment where the Puritan leader at the time, a guy by the name of Oliver Cromwell, believes he's really a voice and instrument of the people. And he goes up and he takes the blood of Charles and he like holds it out to the people. You know, he's like, he bleeds just like we do. And the people are horrified because he's he's sort of saying he's defeating a monster but the people see he's almost becoming a monster himself and oliver cromwell in order to keep the people who are legit horrified by what he's done he has to create this new model army he has to go after folks who are saying oliver cromwell's gone too far and begins persecuting them and it just the cycle it just reminds you of how the kings have been treating their subjects he like becomes a king and all but but me. So it reminds me of a great movie that I, uh, one of my favorite movies now, probably my favorite movie of all time, uh, Harvey Dent, uh, Two Face. If you if you know anything about Batman movies, is you either die a hero 
where you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And I think for Oliver Cromwell, he uh, thought he was a hero, but he, he, he became that villain. Okay, so who wins in this thing? Well, eventually the English people. Oliver Cromwell is going to rule things with a dictatorship. He called it the Commonwealth. He was the Lord Protector of that Commonwealth. And when he dies, the people are scrambling to figure out what do they do next. And everyone says, let's go back to the monarchy. Let's go back to the way things were. And they call this the Restoration. So after Cromwell dies, they go to the Restoration. The monarchy is restored, but the problem is, is that the king at the time, James II, is a Catholic. He was the guy that was closely related to Charles, and so it's like they picked him because he was the next guy. But he was a Catholic, and he would not renounce his vows. He was like, no, I'm a Catholic. Like, that's the way it is. So they're waiting for King James to die. When he does, England's left in this situation like we need some unity. And so here's what they do. They go to King James the second's daughter, Mary, and they say, Mary, you know, will you be a Protestant? And Mary's like, yep, I'm a Protestant. They're like, okay, we need some, some wealth because our country's torn asunder from a civil war. And so they go to uh, the newest bachelor, William, from the Netherlands, and they're like, let's, let's marry these two countries together. They're both Protestant. And what happens is together they create the wealth from William but also the Protestant faith from Mary, the, the blood ties from Mary, right? It's you know, the blue bloods of, of royalty. The two come together in this glorious revolution, this bloodless transfer of power. The two decide to sign something called the English Bill of Rights, which takes the Magna Carta, puts it on steroids, basically, where the king and queen realize that absolutism ain't working. And if they stay on this trajectory, they're going to get more revolution and it's going to be bad. So what they do is they say, listen, we're going to work regularly with Parliament as part of our Bill of Rights. We're going to give our people certain freedoms and rules uh, that we will follow. For example, no cruel and unusual punishment like the you know, Spanish Inquisition would do. They also do something where they grant habeas corpus. You can't be in prison unless you break the law. So you actually have to physically break the law. We can't just throw you in jail because we think you broke the law or because I don't like your face, okay? This is a big, big moment where the people are getting rights in England. We call this moment a limited monarchy, okay? Where the king is literally sharing power with the parliament. So this is the big change. England was able to do it and they do it through civil war, but they get to that final stage of limited monarchy. So remember, well, how does this thing set up? It starts with Charles being Catholic and that, that Puritan Protestant sort of you know, anger and resentment. The two sides become the cavaliers who support the king and the roundheads who are mostly Puritans and people who, su who support parliament. The two sides fight. They roundheads capture the king. King Charles and execute him. Oliver Cromwell's the leader, and Oliver Cromwell does exactly what the king had done before. He rules with an iron fist, creates the Commonwealth, creates his new model army, and begins running things like a dictatorship. When he dies, James II takes over for a very little bit, who's Catholic. When he dies, they restore the monarchy with William and Mary. They call it the Glorious Revolution because it's bloodless, and they sign the English Bill of Rights, and they end up with a limited monarchy. That's like the Cliff Notes version of the entire English Civil War, which I think is one of the hardest things to, to sort of grasp and understand. So if you need to listen to it again, rewind and go, guys. This is a hard, hard subject. All right, I'm almost done here. I've got two more topics that I wanted to set up here. So as the English Civil War is leaving your brain, let's go to the Enlightenment. Let's talk about the Enlightenment here and make sure you've got the key philosophs. This is great review for your play as well that you'll have to do. So here we go. Some vocab that I'll be using. What is the Enlightenment? It's really a time where people are just questioning the world around them, uh, particularly government, but also like human nature. What does it mean to be a human? You've got philosophs. Uh, not it's the French take on philosopher, 
Okay, a philosoph is a writer or thinker of this time period. And then you've got your salons. This is where people meet to discuss their ideas. And just know, by the way, I showed you a time period, 715 to 1789. 89 is the uh, French Revolution. That's rough. It just gets you close, 1700s, okay? So let's start with Thomas Hobbes. This is the grumpy old man. Uh, Thomas Hobbes wrote this book called The Leviathan. And if you study the Bible at all, you'll know what Leviathans are. They're these biblical monsters. If you ever watch Supernatural, you know what Leviathans are. Again, biblical monsters. Belief humans are naturally evil. Uh, he believed that we were all motivated by greed and uh, we're just really selfish creatures that we were born that way. And he said the only way for humans to exist on this world are to follow absolute monarchs. He was like, absolute monarchs keep us evil human beings in check. We, he, His idea, his basic idea is like, Without a strong leader, humans will eat each other. They will destroy each other. They will war and kill and maim until there is nothing left. So absolute monarchs, you should be thanking these absolute monarchs for keeping human beings in check. So that's Thomas Hobbes. Angry man Hobbes is the way I remember him. He reminds me of that Clint Eastwood character from Gran Torino, get off my lawn, you know, that guy. His foil, his opposite, is John Locke. So John Locke says all people are good at heart. He believed that there was this concept of natural rights. He says everyone's born with certain rights, and he sort of articulates what those rights are. You, you would recall natural rights as life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, like that Thomas um, Jefferson idea, okay? Natural rights, think of that. And he, his big idea here, besides people who are you know, naturally good right, and have natural rights, is that a government exists to protect those natural rights, to protect your, your rights to property, to protect your rights to liberty. He's like, if your government doesn't do that, he says, you have the right to rebel. That's your, also your natural right. You have the right to overthrow that government. And America really takes this to heart, by the way. They're like, yeah, you know, we believe in what he called the social contract. The government must do for me in order for me to you know, be loyal to it. There was, there was this trade-off, okay? I'll follow the government, but the government better be protecting my natural rights. So L for Locke, L for Liberty. If that helps you a little bit, I hope it does. Um, John Locke is the opposite of Thomas Hobbes in many ways. Next philosoph is Voltaire. And Voltaire is a funny guy. He's big into satire. I really like to make fun of religion. He was, he was a funny guy. He was locked away in the Bastille for criticizing uh, French nobility. So that sharp, t you know, silver tongue he had kind of got him in trouble. He learned, though, while being locked away in the Bastille, right, that the most important thing in this world is the ability to criticize, the ability to speak openly, the ability to have communication, speech, press, religion. Like, those things are what keep freedom in a society. And so for Voltaire... The things that are happening today in our society where we're, you know, going after each other and, you know, telling people that they can't speak and all that kind of stuff. He would be totally against uh, any of that stuff. You heard of cancel culture or stuff like that. Voltaire would be like, scream, no way, we need freedom of speech, okay? His uh, famous phrase, I may not agree with the words you say, but I'll defend to the death. You're right to say it. Great quote might have been from his wife, from what I've been reading. Uh, he might have stolen that quote, but it's a good quote nonetheless. I may not agree with the words you say, but I defend to the death, you're right to say it. All right, and then Montesquieu. Now, why do I say Montesquieu? Well, Montesquieu believed in something called separation of powers. That's a very regent's term. What is separation of powers? Stretch back to like seventh and eighth grade social studies. It's checks and balances. He believed that you needed three branches, right? A few branches to check each other. So in the United States, we have the judicial, the executive, and the legislative, and they each have powers and they can check one another. Well, that's, that's, we took this idea. Montesquieu gave us this idea. So why do I say Montesquieu? Well, you get three branches. Montesquieu. Three syllables, three branches, okay? 
you can remember that, or if you're on the test, just say it aloud, and I think you'll get it. Okay, Montes Q. Three branches of separation of powers. And then you've got the most dangerous of all, Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau hated salons. He hated the places where philosophers went to go and talk and, you know, uh, gossip with one another. He was like, he, he hated them. He was born poor, orphaned, home to home. Like, So he didn't have this wealthy sort of, you know, upbringing that the others did. And he started to see the world quite differently. You know, for him, he said, the only way for a government to exist is to follow the general will. So what is the general will? It's maybe the most dangerous thing I'll teach you all year. The general will, he said, was that the majority should be the thing that rules society. Right? Society should be ruled by the will of the majority, the general will. So whatever most people want is what we should get. One way of looking at that is direct democracy. Okay, That's ancient Athens. That is... You know, you go out there and you vote directly on issues. So if you think that, you know, school should be shortened, you go out, we vote. And if, if most people say school should be shortened, it shouldn't be seven hours, it should be five. Okay, we vote on it and we all agree it's five hours. Okay. But historians say, well, that's mob rule. Because, you know, maybe that's a you know, soft issue, right? But what about an issue where, you know, someone has, you know, tried to take over the government or something? You know, and we all are angry at that, and we go to this mob rule idea. What could happen? Well, that person might be executed immediately, or maybe others, and it can get out of control quickly. When you hand power to a mob, right, a mob isn't one person, and sometimes people, when they're all clustered together like that, there's this anger, there's this rage that develops in a mob, and so... You might not be ruled by rational thinking. You might be ruled by emotional thinking. If that didn't make sense to you at all, when we do the French Revolution, you're going to see what emotional thinking does. You're going to see what, what mob rule can become. Uh, this thirst for blood that will become Rousseau's majority uh, will or general will. So what is Rousseau's idea? Will of the majority. That's what he wants. He believes that whatever most people say, that's what we should do. So French Revolution 1789, we'll be talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. All right, last, and I'll go through these quick, okay? Scientific Revolution. So we'll start off with Galileo, talk to you a little bit about who Galileo is, and then we'll transition to these other scientists here. So Galileo, born one of six kids, he is big family in Florence. His father's a musician, and at an early age, he um, sees that Galileo is very gifted. So he sends him to a monastery. He's like, go learn, you know, be educated, right? This is Florence is the heart of the Renaissance, where everyone's trying to be educated in Greek and Roman culture. So, point is this: he gets out there, goes to the monastery. He's gifted at math. He knows numbers. He wants to figure out how things work. Like he's very, very smart, and. Uh, one thing that his father taught him was always, Galileo, look after your brother, Michelangelo. He's like, no matter how smart you are, that's the thing I need you to do. Take care of your brother. Like, family is most important. His brother was not like Galileo. He was not like this, you know, whiz scientist or mathematician. He was a musician and was talented. But the way musicians work is... You know, they'll have money for a little while, and then they won't get a couple gigs, and then they'll have no money. So, because of that, his brother, Michelangelo, is always asking Galileo for money. And Galileo takes care of him, because that's what his father told him to do. And when his father passed away, like he makes his promise, like, he'll take care of my brother. I'll do everything i got to do to take care of my younger brother, Michelangelo. Don't you worry, Dad. So Galileo, guys, he even quits uh, school. He's... He goes off, you know, he doesn't finish school all the way. He's like, okay, I'm going to go start teaching because he was that smart. And he just starts teaching at night. He's taking jobs to just pay for, for his brother and send his brother money because he knew he needed it. And so he's doing whatever he can do to take care of his brother. Well, one night, he does something crazy. You know, he, he was the type of kid, you know, or type of guy that uh, has a telescope and he's looking up at the sky and like, 
points it up. When he when he's looking at the stars and he's doing these mathematical calculations, he sees how the moon is sort of like revolving around other planets, and, and he he through mathematics and through observation comes together and is able to prove that Nicholas Copernicus, way back in the day, had this idea called the heliocentric theory. And it was just a theory, and Copernicus shut his mouth about it because he knew it was contrary to the church's official doctrine, which was that the earth was the center of the universe. Okay. Galileo says no. He's like, church is wrong, Copernicus was right, and here's the math to prove it. And he begins to write and tell people about it. And he thinks like this is revolutionary. Like he's gonna make a ton of money off of this. Like people are gonna want to buy his book. Like he has changed the way we look at the universe. The sun is at the center of the universe. It's not the earth. Like the church is wrong. I I, I did it. Here's the findings. And he wasn't arrogant about it. He wasn't, you know, saying, oh, you know, the church is like the worst thing in the world. He was just saying, no, look, this is this is the math. I can prove it. And then knock, knock, knock. The Catholic Church shows up. And they're like, uh, Galileo, we need you to come with us. You're going to go to the Vatican. You're going to go to Rome. And you're going to visit uh, the Pope and the Cardinals. And you're going to explain this little theory you think you have. And Galileo's like, okay, you know, I, I totally, you know, I'll, I'll show you. I can show you the calculations. And he gets up in front, and the church doesn't want to hear him. Right? They, they don't actually care about the calculations. I don't even know if they could understand all the crazy math that he's doing, right? Point is, is, they said, Galileo, you said, you're going to recant. He's like, what? You're going to recant. You're going to take back what you said. You're going to officially say it in front of everybody that you were wrong. He's like, well, why would I do that? Like, I'm right, actually. He's like, no, we're going to ruin your career, okay? And uh, we might we might have to take your life. I'm like, whoa. He's like, okay, listen, listen. I'll recant. I'll take it back. And they're like, oh, yeah, and by the way, you're going to be on house arrest for the rest of your life. He's like, why? He's like, we don't want this idea that you have spreading around the rest of the world. Like, no. Geocentric theory, that's it. Church is right. You're wrong. And you're going to stay in that house. That's it. So Galileo's story, you know, this story of scientific change ends up horrific for him. But what what ends up worse, you know, the house arrest, it really, really bothered And It's why, why in that painting, his eye it just looks like a sad, defeated man, you know? It's because in house arrest, he couldn't take care of his brother anymore. He could barely take care of himself. And so that promise that he made at the end of his father's life, you know, the, the promise to take care of his brother, he could no longer provide for him. And I, there's... Uh, Letters, you know, that go from Michelangelo to Galileo, like begging him for money, you know, like a brother, I need your help, and he couldn't help him. He couldn't help him. And at the end, the, the two grew apart, and eventually, he didn't hear from Michelangelo again. So, I tell you the story because you know, there's all these scientists, and sometimes it just feels so far away. But there were people with stories like this. Stories that, uh, I don't know, they just get to me sometimes, guys. So, let's, uh, let's talk about these scientists and make sure that you have your notes, uh, together, figured out. Uh, here's some vocab. I use two of them geocentric and then heliocentric. So, geocentric, Earth is at the center of the universe. It's incorrect. Catholic Church put that out. Heliocentric is actually the correct theory. Sun at the center. Gravity. Uh, you should ask your science teachers about gravity. It's 9.81. Now you know a really cool math fact when you're doing calculations. And then rationalism is a way of thinking that is really through reason. It's it's the same like ideas coming from the Renaissance where you're like very secular in the in your thought. Okay. Don't try to explain things through magic or the supernatural. Really focus on how the world works through reason. Okay. So who are the scientists? First, Copernicus. He's the guy that develops the heliocentric theory initially. It's a theory. He puts, you know, these ideas out there, but it's, it's almost like, you know, I think it could be possible. It's not, this is how it is. 
So Nicholas Copernicus puts it out because he's afraid the Catholic Church is going to not like that he is challenging their official position. So he keeps quiet, but the writing's out there, the ideas are out there, and then it's Galileo who expands upon that, uses the development of the telescope to prove Copernicus right, and he is the guy that develops the heliocentric theory uh, in proof, right? He proves it. Isaac Newton, you've heard of, the three laws of motion. You've uh, heard of gravity, and if you haven't, you felt it every day, your entire life. Okay, it's this, you know, attraction, this you know, pushing down that you feel always. This is Isaac Newton's ideas, someone to be aware of. Uh, René Descartes is a, Descartes is a famous um, thinker and scientist who believes that reason is more important than tradition. Kind of comes up with this idea that we need to prove everything through reason and sort of launches this this enlightenment but also scientific revolution further and is going to become somebody who scientists look up to for that idea right we're not just going to do things for the sake of doing them we're going to do them because we can prove it through reason and then last is bacon you gotta thank bacon for the scientific method and i don't think i need to teach you about the scientific method you guys use that in science class every day right okay so that's my lecture uh, age of absolutism an hour and six minutes thanks for listening guys i hope this helps you hope it gets you a nice little refresher or a nice little preview for our unit. Take care, guys.